Hi everybody, I'm Shanna, and welcome to Fellowship of the Parks online campus. We are so glad you have joined us online for the next hour. Our hope is that you're able to get the FOTP experience today from wherever you are. If you are watching for the first time, you can follow along with today's message notes with the tab on the right of the screen. Let us know you are here or leave a prayer request by filling out the connection card at the top of the screen. Our service will begin in just a few moments. Thank you for joining us at FOTP Online today. Welcome to Fellowship of the Parks. I'm so excited that you've come to worship with us. Whatever season of life you're in, whether you're down in the valley or up on the mountaintop, I just want to encourage you to sing and lift your voice with us. praise so excited you're here would you guys take a moment and welcome somebody say hello to your neighbor somebody close around you
how could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do, but every song must stand, Lord, you never do. Every voice. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. And all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king except for a heart singing. we sing together. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king. Except for my heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. 
Hey, welcome to Fell Soup at the Parks. My name is Troy Wolf. I'm the online campus pastor, and with me today I have Charles Thornton. I'm the Grapevine campus pastor. Man, it's amazing being out here in Grapevine. The place is buzzing. There are people of all ages out here. Man, it's it's pretty awesome. If you're in this area, you need to check it out for sure. But we want to connect with you right where you're at here online. And a great way for us to do that is our digital connection card. You can fill that out through the website or the app. Make sure to fill that out. And if it's your first time, let us know. I'd love to send you a free Starbucks gift card just to say thanks for being here. Also, probably the most important part of the connection card to me, Charles, is a place for prayer request. Yeah. I love to be able to pray for you. So at the very, very least, make sure we know who you are and how I can pray for you. We'd love to connect with you. You know, talking about connection, here at Fellowship of the Parks this summer, we've got all kinds of exciting things going on. We've got missions projects. We've got young people going to camp. Man, we love young people here at Fellowship of the Parks. Man, we want to make an impact in their life. And right here in Grapevine, there's all kinds of amazing things happen. Charles, why don't you share with us some cool stuff? Sure. Just a few minutes, you're going to see our baptismal video uh, across all five campuses. Every one of those uh, people baptized has a story. Let me tell you about Sarah Flanagan and her daughter Blakely. Uh, so Sarah, her mom, Karen, moved here from Sweetwater a couple of years ago and was uh, in a bad place in her life. She started reading the New Testament, committed her life to Christ, went to Sarah and Kyle. They all lived in Arlington and said, where do I go to church? They said, we don't know. We don't go to church. Let's ask our neighbors, Sandy and Jackie, who attend church here. And so Sandy and Jackie said, you need to go to Fellowship of the Parks. It's a little bit of a drive, but you'll, you'll enjoy it. So Karen comes, she gets baptized, they start coming. Now Sarah and Blakely have got baptized. I did a scripture memory group this spring for adults. Blakely memorized every scripture. And so they got baptized along with others. And here's what I want you to know. Uh, if you have friends or relatives in the Grapevine area, invite them here, because great things are happening. The second thing is this, if you give out of generosity, you, your generosity here is what makes these stories possible. When you watch, if, you're, if you express yourself generously here, I want you to know every single baptism you see, you're a part of that story. Thanks for your generosity. Absolutely. So make sure that you can fill that out on the website or the app. But when you give, just like Charles said, you have a part in every one of these stories.
So for the first 43 years of my life, uh, I didn't know what people meant by feeling anxious. Like I knew what the word meant, obviously, but I didn't really know what that feeling was like. In fact, my dad, uh, he experienced anxiety and worry uh, to a pretty severe degree. There were times he wouldn't leave his house and he would say, my anxiety is just too high. And if I'm being honest, if I'm being transparent, uh, I would often write that off as uh, that's a self-esteem issue. Uh, you, you're, just, you're just lazy or you're just super introverted and you don't want to be around people. Fast forward uh, to uh, a, a couple of years of a pandemic. Uh, fast forward to uh, a personal relationship of mine that was in a, in a tough time. Fast forward to my dad passing away. Uh, I sat in the room with him while he took his last breath. Fast forward to uh, times of pretty high social and, and political tension. Uh, and then we come back from the pandemic and things are just pretty uncertain uh, in the church. I've got kids becoming teenagers, uh, going into high school, into some pretty crazy uh, economic times of ups and downs. And I can distinctly remember two Sundays uh, sitting in church, which by the way, is one of the places I am most comfortable and I enjoy being more than anywhere else. Two Sundays I remember in church sitting there uh, with this really, really weird feeling just in my gut uh, and my heart just really racing seemingly for no reason. Uh, and all of a sudden I have this, this dread, like this, this really bad concern that I'm not prepared for this message that I'm about to speak in 20 minutes. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. This is what people mean when they say they're experiencing an anxiety attack. Now look, I was always, a guy. I'm super comfortable with uncertainty. I'm comfortable in chaotic moments uh, when things change last minute. I love like the, kind of the chaos that happens here on Sundays of people coming and going. I was always the guy that was like, you know what? It's all good, like we'll figure it out. It, it's gonna be fine. We'll figure it out, we'll make it happen. What are you worried about? For the first time in my life, I had real compassion for people who worry. I had real compassion for people who have anxiety. These two Sundays were the very first time in my life this was real to me. And a lot of you have experienced that and you know exactly what I'm talking about. And I'm sorry, honestly, that I wasn't more empathetic, but this was the first time in my life I was anxious and I was worried. And here's the thing. When I say I'm worried, Jesus flips the script. Jesus says, I'll take care of you. And we've looked at the, the idea over the last few weeks of this series called Flip the Script that we think one thing, but the truth is actually something else. And a lot of times we're talking about Jesus talking in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, well, like I know you've heard this, but this is actually the truth. And today we're going to talk about, I know you've heard this about worry, but this is actually the truth. I mean, I'm really glad you guys are here, tuned in uh, for today's message. If you're watching uh, online, welcome. If you're out at one of our campuses live, and thanks so much for being here. Hey, I hope that uh, if you're online, uh, that you'll download the listening guide, uh, that you'll click through and use all the resources that are there. If you're at one of our campuses, hopefully you got a program uh, when you walked into the building. There's a listening guide in there. You can follow along uh, in that listening guide. It'll have the main points, the big outline. It'll have our scripture in there uh, as well. You can use the FOTP Church app. Download it uh, if you don't have it yet. You can follow along again with all the scripture and the outline will be there for you. Or if you have your Bibles in person, go ahead and open that up. We'll be in Matthew chapter six. We're going to start in verse 25 again. We're going to continue with the Sermon on the Mount. And again, this is, this is a big, powerful moment where Jesus is speaking to uh, what we believe is his disciples and then probably other people were there who were, I don't know, maybe kind of followers of Jesus or becoming followers of Jesus. And he wants to make some things really, really clear. Because I know you may have heard some things in the past, but let me set you straight. Jesus is flipping the script. So let's look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 34. It starts like this, and we'll kind of break it up and stop as we go. It says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? 
And Jesus starts really, and God's, he's speaking to us really, because what do you worry about? What do you guys worry about? What do you worry about the most? You worry about provision, like, what, will I be able to pay the bills, pay the mortgage, pay the rent, pay the car note? Can I, can I keep the lights on? You worry about your health, right? Like, am I going to get sick? Are people around me going to get sick, particularly in the last couple of years? And then you worry about your stuff. Like, am I going to have enough stuff? Do I get a nice enough car? Is the house big enough? Do, do I get fun things? Those are the things that most of you and me, it's what we worry about. Now, let let me ask you this. Let's say you have a friend who trusts you, who loves you, and they come to you and they say, hey man, I've got a problem and here's what it is. What do you think I should do? Would you ever look at your friend and give the advice, man, I just think that you ought to go worry about it. you, You would never give that advice. And why not? Because it's terrible advice. It's really the dumbest thing you can do when when you have a concern is just to sit and worry about it. But here's the funny thing. We do that ourselves. We do that to ourselves. And and Jesus is telling us that's not the response. So my my deal is always this. If we're going to know how to not do something, like we need to know what that thing is. So we need to know what worry really is. Take a look at the definition of worry with me. Worry is this. Worry is when you give way to anxiety or unease or when you allow one's mind to dwell on difficulty or trouble. You guys do this? You dwell on your difficulties or troubles? Do you give way to anxiety? Like, do you let it consume you? Do you let it take over you? I never have until a few months back. And I gave way. I allowed that to take over and I allowed that to consume me. Now look, let let me state one thing up front. I fully believe that that we should have a godly sense of responsibility, right? We should have a sense of planning, uh, of management, like stewardship, we call it in church, of our resources. So I think we should plan. I think we should look back and learn from the past. However, know this, an ungodly, like an untrusting sense of worry, it usually hides itself or, or disguises itself as responsible. I'm just being responsible. I'm just planning for the future. When a lot of times that's not what you're doing, you're worrying. In worrying, if I could be honest with you, a lot of times it's a choice. Worrying is a choice. Look back at the definition. I've underlined some, some key words. It says, it says, give way. Like this is active. This isn't passive worry is happening to you. You're allowing it. You give way to anxiety or unease. You allow one's mind to dwell on your difficulty or trouble. Worry is kind of a choice, isn't it? It's kind of a choice. It's an active thing. You're you're giving way. You're allowing. You're dwelling on. Let's continue in our passage. Back to chapter 6 will be verse 28 through 30. It says, and and why? And, And why do you worry about clothes? You see how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spill. Like they're not working to get that. It, it's just happening. They don't labor or spend. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor, like, I mean, like the robes and, and the well-dressed and the, and the royalty, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. Like he didn't do that. God was doing that. If, if that is how God closed the grass of the field, which seemingly kind of meaningless, kind of low, right, on the totem pole. If, if he would clothe the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Who's he talking to? You. You of little faith. Last week we talked about like living life according to what really matters and doing the things that really matter. And you know why you have trouble doing that? It's because you have a faith issue. And this this is a tough thing to hear, but your worry, it's a faith issue. Now, now look, I I do want to address, there are some of you, like there are biochemical imbalances in your body that cause you to worry and cause you anxiety. I'm not saying you choose that. And if if that is you, uh, look, I've had friends and family who struggle with that. I get it. 
I know it's real. I hope you get that addressed through a psychologist, through a psychiatrist, uh, through counseling, through medications, whatever it is. But for the majority of us, your worry is a faith issue. And our inability to live according to what really matters the most, most comes from our fear. It comes from a lack of faith. We worry about the response. We're worried if I'm really doing what's most important, if I'm giving, serving, loving, you know, according to what matters most to God, well, what's the response going to be? If I'm giving what financially, what's going to happen to me? If I'm being generous with my time, right? Well, what's, what's the outcome of that? What's the cost of that? We worry about that. And that is a faith issue. And Jesus calls us out on that. Let's keep going. Verse 31 through 34. Jesus calls us out. He says, so do not worry. Don't worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? The things that we worry about, right? What shall we wear? For the pagans, the non-believers, the non-Jesus followers, for the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. You worry because you need them. You worry because you want them. God knows you need them. Jesus tells us your heavenly father knows that you need them. So what if I'm not going to worry, what should I do instead? Flip the script. Jesus says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. This is so powerful. Rather than worry, seek his kingdom Seek his righteousness and all these things, all the stuff you worry about, all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Look, Jesus says, hey, yeah, remember the past. Plan for the future. I I get, but live in the present. Live in the present in today. Live, seek his righteousness, seek his kingdom today. So, so why, why is this Jesus speaking so very directly, in my opinion, so very directly about worry? Why was he speaking like that? And, and here's what I think Jesus knows a couple of things. Well, I think Jesus knows a lot of things, but he knows a couple of things about worry particularly. First is this, worry diminishes our value. Yeah, when we worry, not not that God values us less, but when we worry, we value ourselves less. We we put ourselves in a lower position when it comes to God. And and in our minds, not to him. Go back to Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 27. Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you eat, what you drink, or your body, or what you'll wear. Again, these are the things that we all worry about. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothes? So important. Hear this. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow. They do not reap. Like they don't, they don't earn it. They don't store away in barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than those birds? If your heavenly father feeds them, if he takes care of them, don't you think he'll take care of you? Like, do you think God doesn't care enough about you? And you may feel that way. You, you may feel like God doesn't care about me being $100 short of my electric bill. God doesn't care about my worry about my son starting to drive. God doesn't care about, I don't know if I can do this job anymore. Yes, he does. Yes, he does every single day. Like I've identified that the things that really took over me, the things that began to worry me a few months back, uh, I had a mortality realization. I realized watching my dad pass away that, you know what? I'm going to pass away one day. I had like, I was 43 to 44 years old at the time. I'm realizing like, gosh, I got, I have teenagers. I'm getting older. This is when I'm like, your health is supposed to start falling apart. You got to have all these tests done because you're a certain age. I'm worried about finances. Like I got three kids. I, I'm trying to send them to college without debt. Like there was just a lot piling up 
on me. And I chose to focus, to allow, and to dwell on the difficulties that I saw coming up or the difficulties that I saw us in. And does God really care about me feeling my mortality? Does God really care that my kids are getting older or making me feel old? Yes. Jesus says, yes, he does. He cares about those stinking birds. Yes, he cares about you. I, I'd give you one quick side note, because I, I think a lot of times we hear passages like this, and you know, okay, well, I'll just turn it over to God. I'm just going to pray. Well, look, the birds don't just pray. Think about the birds Jesus refers to. The birds don't just sit in the nest with their mouths open waiting for Jesus to feed them, do they? No, birds go out, right? And, and they fly around, they build their nests, and they gather food. They do their job. They work within the design, and then God provides for them. Like, that's us. I, I can't just pray about my health and my finances and, and just sit there and, and wait for God to do his thing. Now I can pray about them. But then I have to make some changes. I have to do some budgeting. I have to do a little bit of planning. I got to kind of work the process. I have to do my part. But I have to do it expectantly and faithfully, not fearfully. Expectantly and faithfully, not fearfully. So Jesus knows that we diminish our value when we worry. And Jesus also knows that worry is really the result of when our priorities get out of order. Our priorities kind of get misaligned. And that's what makes us worry. Do you remember back to the passage, what we're supposed to do first? Look back at Matthew uh, chapter 6, verse 33 through 34. Uh, the important word here is first. But seek first, like before you worry about all that stuff and you, and you fret about what you're going to eat and what you're going to wear and where you're going to live. Before you do that, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. You seek his kingdom, you seek his righteousness. The other stuff, man, it's going to work itself out. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Like there's enough going on already. Don't worry about tomorrow. And the truth is, it's kind of pointless. I read this study done by Penn State a couple years back. It's a huge study, by the way. It didn't just study like four kids in a class. It studied thousands of people. And it asked them to kind of list the things that they were worried about. And it followed them for a lengthy period of time. Here's what they found out. Of their list of things that they were worried about each day, 91% of the things they worried about never happened. 91% never even happened in any way. That leaves 9%. A third of the time of those 9% of things that did kind of happen, a third of the time, they were nothing. They were not nearly as bad as expected. So here's the math on that. 97% of the time, worrying is useless. It's useless. And did you know this? Worrying, you'll have the same biological response. I don't know, maybe that feeling in your gut, a heart racing for no reason, getting sweaty. You'll have the same biological response when you worry as if the event actually happened. It's useless. Not only is it useless, it's harmful. So the first thing we have to do is we have to find and then do the will of God. Seek his righteousness and seek his kingdom. So, so if you're going to remove, like how do you remove worry from your life? I'd encourage you to do this. And I think particularly in 2022, this is the biggest thing. Filter your consumption. Filter what, like what are you allowing in? What are you dwelling on? Remove the worry by changing what you consume. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Are you seeking God's righteousness or are you seeking the agenda of your favorite news channel? What do you consume more of? What do you think more about? What do you dwell on? God's word or CNN or Fox News? What do you dwell on? What do you allow into your life more of? Scripture or Facebook or Twitter posts? Think, think back to that definition of worry. Do you give way to anxiety or unease by the things that you consume? Do you allow, like you let those things into your mind? Do you choose to dwell on the difficulties and the troubles of the world? Or do you choose to dwell on the things 
of God. Replace your worry by changing what you consume. And once we realize our value and we realign our priorities, then we can take our worries to God. Then we can really take our worries to God. And my fellow control freaks, I get it. This is hard. I just want to fix it. Like, I wish God would just say, oh, hey, Chuck, thanks for praying. Here's a list of things you should do to make this work, and I can just take care of it. Like, I want to be in control of that. And I realized uh, a handful of months ago, I couldn't do it. There was no list to work, and it wasn't about me. Here's the deal. The worries of the world are so much bigger than you. They're so much bigger than you, and they're so much bigger than me. They will consume you. They will consume me. But here's the cool thing. They're huge to us. They will consume us. They are like a speck of dust to God. The worries of the world, I know, like your financial situation, your kid situation, your marriage situation, your job, I I get it. They're huge to you. They're nothing. They're nothing to God. And that's why we bring our concerns, we bring our anxieties, we bring our worries to Him. Look at Philippians real quick, chapter 4, verse 4 through 7. So what what is Paul? We've heard of the Apostle Paul. He's written, you know, most of the New Testament. Uh, This is a guy, Paul was like us, right? Paul was a guy like, I don't know if I believe. Paul actually was pretty extreme in his unbelief, but he kind of came around like most of us in this church, like we didn't believe. And and like, I can really truly relate to Paul. And Paul was like, man, he spent time in jail. And this is what he's writing in those moments. He says, rejoice in the Lord always, which I think is great. And for some reason, Paul, again, I will say it again, because this is hard to hear, because this is very difficult to do. I'm going to tell you a second time. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. So, so through all this stuff, Paul, with my situation, with my kids and my marriage and my You want me to rejoice. And Paul says, yes, rejoice in the Lord always. And he goes on, he says, don't be anxious about anything. Well, great, Paul. What do I do instead? Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, here's, here's, here's the alternative. In every situation, by prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, bring your stuff to God. Bring your stuff to God with prayer and petition. So prayerfully bring your stuff to him. And what's going to be the outcome and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Leave this up here, verse 7. If you do this stuff and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding and is the opposite of worry— the peace of God is the opposite. It's, the, it's what combats anxiety and worry. So if you will be patient and compassionate and forgiving, that's the gentleness thing. If you'll be prayerful and you'll be grateful, you'll combat anxiety and worry. That's the alternative. So your next step this week is to focus on what you can do, like do your part, but then to trust God. Focus on what you can do, and then just trust God to do what he does. And I'll just tell you, it's been a handful of months since I've experienced any anxiety. I had two or three pretty bad episodes and I haven't experienced anything since. You know what? My circumstances haven't changed all that much. But, but when I was able to get back to seeing myself and seeing my life, the way that God sees me and the way that God values me, when I was able to realign my priorities, uh, of serving and loving and giving the way that God instructs me to. And then when I was finally able to take my worries to God, and look, I'm a pastor. This is what I do for a living. You think like I would have all, I didn't have it down. I was trying to fix my stuff and just kind of deal with it. When I finally turned those things over to God and said, I, I don't know, like I just need you to do this. Things changed. And I think the most important thing was, was really choosing to focus on the things that I'm grateful for and not what concerns me. And look, I, I, I told you before, I'd encourage you, get help with this. 
If you don't, if you can't figure this out and you can't connect the doctor, let us help you right on that connection card that, that you want help with this. You want to meet with a pastor or meet with a staff member. We'd love to do that. If you want help by praying through this, please write that on that connection card. You know, whether you're doing it on the app or, or turning one in at a campus, please take a minute to do that. I want to leave you with this quote I read. This is from Charles Spurgeon. He was a pastor uh, way long ago in the 1890s. But this is so incredibly powerful. And I, I found this when I was researching for this message. He said this. He said, people who are very happy, especially those who are very happy in the Lord, are not apt to give offense or to take offense. Please hear this next statement. Please hear this. Their minds are so sweetly occupied with higher things that they are not easily distracted by the little troubles which naturally arise among such imperfect creatures as we are. Joy in the Lord is the cure for all discord. I hope that, that you can leave this message and have your mind so sweetly occupied with the higher things, God's kingdom, his righteousness, that you're not easily distracted by the little troubles that you allow to creep in and that you choose to dwell on. And I love to pray that we can all do that. So if you'd pray with me, Heavenly Father, God, I pray that you would just overwhelm us and preoccupy our minds, that, that we would be so focused on the sweet, godly things, your kingdom, your righteousness, that the, the, to you, the little tiny troubles of this world wouldn't affect us. God, I pray we'd be so focused on you. We don't, we don't even have the time or the bandwidth to focus on those unimportant things. I pray we could be so focused on living for you and doing the things that really, really matter expectantly, prayerfully, not fearfully, that God, the troubles of the world begin to fade. I pray that we would begin to see our value the way that you value us, not the way the world does, not the way society does, but the way that you value us. Knowing, God, that if you take care of those little birds, how much more you care about, you love, you concern yourself with, and you will take care of us. God, we're incredibly grateful that my little things are big to you that you do in fact care about the little things that concern me. And God, I pray that me knowing that and knowing that you will take care of them will relieve the worries and the stress. And I pray for the folks in our church that they would experience their value in you. They'd be able to realign their priorities and just give their stuff to you because you love us and you care for us, and you're going to take care of us. God, we love you. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you that he flipped the script and said, do not worry. Instead, seek the kingdom and the righteousness of God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for watching. At the top of the page, you'll see a button for the connection card. Please take a few moments and fill that out. It's a great way to open up a line of communication with us. Fellowship of the Parks is a generous church. Your giving allows us to share the good news of Christ with others, including this online campus. If you would like to give, simply click the Give button above. You can visit FOTP.church to find a campus location with convenient service times near you. Thanks again for watching today, and we'll see you next time.